Chapter 18 of the Life and Adventures of Michael Armstrong, the Factory Boy. This is a LibriVox recording. Chapter 18 An Explanatory Epistle Which Does Not Prove Satisfactory. Plans for the Future, Followed by Active Measures to Carry Them into Effect. A Morning Visit to Mrs. Gabberly. During the whole of the day which followed Miss Brotherton's expedition to Hoxley Lane, that young lady remained waiting at home not very patiently for Sir Matthew Dowling's promised communication but still it came not and when at an hour too late to hope for it any longer she at length retired to bed it was in a state of irritation and anxiety that left her little chance of quiet slumber pale harassed and fearing she knew not what for the little fellow for whose safety she had undertaken to answer miss brotherton joined her good nurse at the breakfast-table incapable of thinking or speaking upon any other subject but it was in vain that the gentle-spirited mrs tremlett again and again declared it to be impossible and quite out of all likelihood that sir matthew should mean any harm by the boy mary though weary of conjectures could by no means end them by coming to the same conclusion nor did the following letter handed to her while she still sat before her untasted breakfast greatly tend to tranquillize her it was from sir matthew dowling himself delicately enveloped highly scented and sealed with prodigiously fine armorial bearings on a shield almost large enough to have adorned the panels of a carriage but all this perfection of elegance was lost on poor mary whose heart indeed seemed to leap into her throat as she tore open the important despatch it contained the following lines my charming neighbour if you knew or could at all guess how fervently i admire the beautiful benevolence you have manifested in trying to quiet the fidgety spirit of poor widow armstrong you would be better able to appreciate the vexation i feel at not yet being able fully to answer your inquiries concerning the boy think not my dearest miss brotherton that i neglected this business to-day on the contrary i do assure you i gave my whole attention to it nevertheless i have by no means succeeded in learning what you wish to know the facts of the case are these a most respectable stocking manufacturer with whom however my foreman is better acquainted than myself employs a multitude of young hands most of whom are apprentices in the different branches of his business it was to this person that the weak and wavering poor woman for whom you are interested agreed to entrust her boy indentures were accordingly prepared and i gave my superintendent orders to have the little fellow supplied with all necessaries desiring that no time might be lost in getting him ready as i knew that people belonging to this stock-weaving establishment were likely to pass through ashley in a day or two and i wished if possible to avoid having the trouble of sending him to his destination myself now it unfortunately happened that my man parsons obeyed this order much more literally than i intended for meeting in ashley the persons i had named to him the very next day he immediately mentioned the circumstance to them and finding that they had a comfortable van and everything convenient with them the whole business was arranged and done before i returned from a visit i had been making at netherby this was certainly being more prompt than was necessary but it would have mattered little comparatively speaking had he not been such a goose as to let the van drive off without even asking to which of the manufactories of the establishment it was going yet although this is vexing my dear miss brotherton i should think it could not be very important i have told parsons to write about it immediately and he shall wait upon you with the information you wish for as soon as he receives it will you my fair friend join us in a little picnic party projected by our young people for thursday next under the greenwood tree in blackberry wood lady clarissa is of course to be one of our society and she will communicate all particulars respecting place and time ever my dear miss brotherton very faithfully yours matthew dowling having read this letter to the end she turned the sheet and began a reperusal of it without uttering a word and when she had again reached its conclusion she put it into the hands of mrs tremlett still without speaking a word before however that excellent but not rapid lady had got half through it poor mary's agitation broke forth what do you think of it nurse for heaven's sake give me your opinion without delay i am quite sure that the poor creatures in hoxley lane whom i have beguiled with my presumptuous promises will pine themselves to death with this uncertainty tremlett for mercy's sake finish reading it and tell me what i can do more it might not have been very easy for any one to have satisfactorily answered this inquiry but the good mrs tremlett was altogether incapable of forming any opinion worth hearing on the subject 
for in truth she neither shared nor fully comprehended the vague fears that were tormenting her young mistress having however at length despite of mary's interruptions contrived to reach the end of the epistle her first words were don't my darling miss mary let me beg of you to refuse at once there is nothing in the world so dangerous in cold catching as these foolish parties on the damp grass and besides the evenings are drawing in now and i am sure oh nurse tremlett nurse tremlett interrupted mary more angry with her than she had ever been in her whole life before how can you be so cruel as to trifle thus why won't you try to think a little for me about this strange mysterious business and give me your opinion lord bless you miss mary if you were to kill me i could not more help thinking of you first than i could fly replied mrs tremlett and indeed my dear i don't see what you should put yourself into such a fuss for what can you think is going to happen to the little boy you'll just spoil that poor sickly body my dear child if you encourage her in having such tantrums because her boy set out upon his journey a day may be earlier than she expected then you really and truly do not believe it possible nurse that sir matthew dowling should have smuggled the boy away without intending to let us know where he has sent him said miss brotherton good gracious no miss mary replied her friend for a moment this opinion brought some consolation with it simply from the decision with which it was uttered but the next all her anxiety returned again for though she felt that there was perhaps something improbable and exaggerated in the idea of the child's being kidnapped in the face of day and as it were before a hundred witnesses there was at least no delusion as to his unhappy mother's state of mind respecting him nor in the fact of her having in some sort pledged her own word that the poor woman and her lame boy should receive tidings of him a little further conversation with mrs tremlett convinced her that her opinion on the subject could be of no great value inasmuch as it was founded solely on the notion that it was not likely sir matthew dowling should want to hide away the little boy no thought mary nor was it likely he should have acted looked and spoken as i saw him do when his poor girl lost her senses from agony at my having witnessed it if i misdoubt him unjustly i will be careful that it shall not injure him i will await his own time for information if it comes no one will be the worse for the impatience with which i shall have waited for it but if it comes not i can be doing no wrong by taking every means of seeking it in conformity with this resolution miss brotherton not only waited with tolerable external composure herself but continued in a great degree to tranquillize the spirits of the widow armstrong likewise and during a whole week sir matthew dowling was permitted to remain unmolested miss brotherton indeed did not meet him under the greenwood tree pleading an indisposition which was not quite imaginary as her excuse but she troubled him with no more questions on the day fixed for this al fresco meeting of nearly the whole neighbourhood edward armstrong was appointed to pay his first visit to milford park during her almost daily visits to his mother she had remarked that though he uttered not a word in contradiction of the reasonings by which she sought to show the improbability that any mischief could have befallen michael his speaking features expressed no confidence in them and wishing upon this day of general riding and driving to remain within her own gates she determined to take the opportunity of conversing with him alone she was by herself in her pretty boudoir when he arrived and perceiving that his pale face was flushed by heat and exercise she made him sit down on the sofa beside her there was something singularly sad in the utter indifference with which his young eye wandered over all the striking and unwanted objects that surrounded him when bad to sit beside the young lady on her silken couch he obeyed without seeming at all conscious that the rest he needed was now afforded in more dainty style than usual and all the intelligence of his soul seemed settled in his eyes as he looked into the face of miss brotherton and faintly murmured is there any news of him no edward there is not replied mary firmly but surely my dear boy this delay cannot justify the look of misery it produces on your countenance tell me edward what is it that you fear for michael i do not know myself replied the boy and yet i think it over in my head day and night only to find out what is the very worst possible they can do to him but is that wise edward or is it right think you while your poor mother has only you left to comfort her that you should only strive to fill your own head and hers with the very worst thoughts your fancy can conjure up i do not fill mother's head with them replied edward i have never told her one single word of all my dismal thoughts 
then you are a good boy and i love you for it but what are your dismal thoughts edward you may tell them to me the boy hesitated for a moment and then said i think sir matthew dowling is a wicked cruel man and i think that he would be more likely to be wicked and cruel to michael than good to him what is it has made you think sir matthew cruel and wicked edward demanded miss brotherton because he is hard and unjust to those who labour for him and because i have seen him laugh and make sport of the tears of little children there was something in the accents of the boy that startled mary she felt inclined to exclaim how much older art thou than thy looks so thrilling was the tone and so profound the feeling with which she spoke yet still she replied it is difficult to see that he could gain any advantage by ill-using michael in any way bad enough to make you look so miserable edward if he keeps him from me is not that enough said the pale boy looking reproachfully at her but edward you knew that he was going to leave you and your mother at least consented to it yes she did consent to it poor dear mother she did consent to it but had i been true as i ought to have been she never would said edward clasping his hands and closing his eyes with a look of intense suffering explain yourself my dear boy said mary kindly in what have you been otherwise than true we agreed together poor michael and me agreed together never to let mother know how bad we were served at the mill and above all we agreed that she should never know how miserable michael was at the great house cause we was sure she'd have him away and so lose the bit of comfortable food she has been having but it was wrong and wicked to deceive her we should have told her all and then michael would have never gone you acted for the best my dear boy and must not reproach yourself replied mary and so far am i from thinking it wrong to keep her mind easy in her present state of health that i strongly advise her being still comforted as much as possible by our manner of talking to her fear not edward that i shall neglect the safety of michael because you will not hear me talk of his being in any danger i will not rest till i know what has become of him mary said this in a tone that left no doubt of her sincerity and it was then for the first time that edward seemed to remember her greatness he stood up before her with a look of tender reverence inexpressibly touching and said solemnly then god will bless you for it and he will bless you my dear child replied mary with tears starting to her eyes he will bless and comfort you for all your duty and affection keep up your spirits edward and above all things never be idle it is for your mother's sake as well as your own that i am anxious you should learn to read and write dear edward and by degrees we shall get you on to ciphering and who knows but we may make a clerk or accountant of you and so enable you to get money even if your health is not very good the boy smiled languidly as he replied i should like it very much if i was to live long enough you will get stout and well edward said mary cheerfully now that you have no hard work to do and you shall come up to the same school that all my boys and girls go to here and when school is over you must come every day to my kitchen with a little basket for your mother you understand edward and once every week you must come up into this room to me with your books that i may see your writing and hear you read a little a gleam of hope and joy kindled in the boy's beautiful eyes as he listened to her and a bright blush mantled his pale cheeks but it was like the flitting sunshine of april chased by a heavy cloud almost before its warmth could be felt or its beauty seen oh if michael could but hear that he exclaimed while tears for the first since the conversation began burst from his eyes that was what poor michael always wanted if i could but learn and so get my bread without mill slavery mike always said he would not mind working himself cause he was so strong but now that very thing is come and he may be will never know it heavy and fast the drops fell from beneath the hand which he had raised to conceal his face till mary as she watched him wept for company this however was not the way to help him and conquering a weakness so every way unwise she spoke to him with affectionate but steady firmness of the exertion it was his duty to make at a time when his mother had none but him to comfort her she had touched the right string the little fellow's nerves seemed braced and every faculty awakened by the words she uttered and if he took back to his mother no tidings of poor michael he brought to her support a young spirit strong in endurance and an intellect that for the first time had whispered to its owner hopes promises and aspirations 
which seemed to make the life he had often loathed a new-found treasure to him mary saw not all that passed in the young mind she had rescued from the listless languor of despair but she perceived enough to satisfy her that she had done him good and that however vain her hopes of benefiting the miserable drakes might be there could be no doubt that in this case at least her efforts would not prove wholly abortive it is wonderful what an energy and renewed impetus this conviction gave to her spirits no mildew can blast more surely or bring a more lamentable feeling of withering over the heart than that caused by the cold and false philosophy which would check every effort to do good lest by possibility success might not attend it the remainder of this day was by no means spent unhappily by the warm-hearted little heiress the schoolmistress was made to expect edward on the morrow and the cook was made to expect edward on the morrow one mercury was dispatched to the town for a choice of collection of slates copies spelling-books and the like and another to mary's tailor in ordinary with instructions to call on the widow armstrong and take measure of her son all this business and a good deal more tending the same way having been satisfactorily got through in the course of the day that kept all the ashley world safely entangled in the thickets of blackberry wood mary brotherton lay down to rest and slept exceedingly well though not urged thereto by having shared in their pleasant fatigues she rose the next morning with a sort of pleasant consciousness of increasing power to walk alone in this busy world and gaily announced at breakfast to mrs tremlett her purpose of immediately making a visit of speculation to mrs gabberly in order to ascertain if any gossip was yet afloat respecting the disappearance of sir matthew dowling's far-famed protege the distance from miss brotherton's mansion to mrs gabberly's cottage was not great and the heiress traversed it without having any fear of officers before her eyes or any other protection than her parasol she was of course received with expressions of unmitigated astonishment at her absence from the gala of the preceding day what on earth my dear child could have kept you away said the animated lady perhaps i was afraid of taking cold mrs gabberly mrs tremlett took care i should remember how short the days are growing mrs tremlett nonsense well now i can tell you that you just lost the most delightful day that anybody ever had such a dinner game of all kinds almost all in savoury jelly too think of that so wholesome you know with the spice and eating it in the open air and all depend upon it my dear miss brotherton that if you suffer yourself to be boxed up by that ignorant old woman you will very soon lose your health altogether and do you know i can't help thinking that you look rather feverish to-day your eyes have that sort of brightness i wish to goodness you would let me feel your pulse nothing will do my pulse so much good my dear mrs gabberly as your telling me all the news you heard yesterday said the young lady good-humouredly shaking the hand that was extended to ascertain her state of health well now my dear i am sure i have no objection in the world to tell you and uh, certainly one does pick up a vast deal of information at such a party as that will you believe it two of the simonses are going to be married really that's very good news i suppose had you a great many people there oh everybody just everybody but your own dear self and i can truly say that if you had been there it would have been quite perfect you are very kind but a person so very much afraid of taking cold is always troublesome on these al fresco occasions lady clarissa was there of course of course my dear in such a flirtation with sir matthew god knows i ain't over strict in any way i despise it because it shows such ignorance of life and good society but i must say i do think they carry the thing a little too far of course a lady of rank and title like lady clarissa is not to be judged altogether like common people i am quite aware of that and nothing can be more thoroughly vulgar than forgetting this and i certainly have lived too much in really first-rate good society not to know it but nevertheless you know there is reason in roasting eggs and even an earl's daughter may get talked of was lady dowling in presence inquired miss brotherton smiling no my dear thank god she was not or we should have had sour looks with our sweet meats i can tell you did sir matthew bring his little favourite with him the little boy he has adopted you know oh dear haven't you heard all that yet well now 
upon my word mary brotherton it will not do you're shutting yourself up in this way catching cold indeed as if i the daughter of my own poor dear father wasn't likely to know more than mrs tremlett about catching cold why my dear the little boy has been sent away i don't know how long with a monstrous premium paid by sir matthew to get him entered at one of the first commercial houses in europe dr crockley was exceedingly agreeable and attentive to me all day yesterday and indeed so he was i must say to everybody we do sometimes differ about spinal complaints and i think he is a great deal too speculative but it is impossible to deny that he can be very agreeable when he chooses it and it was he that told me all about this last noble act of sir matthew to be sure he is an honour to the country if ever there was one sir matthew i mean it is such men as that miss brotherton that brings wealth and prosperity to our glorious country to think only of the hands he employs fifteen hundred children taking all his mills together he told us yesterday besides several women and men oh it is glorious to be sure however dr crockley did just whisper to me but i don't believe he meant it should go much farther he did certainly hint that poor cross lady dowling did not like to have the little fellow in the house and that was one reason why good sir matthew was in such a hurry to place him did you happen to hear to what part of the country the boy had been sent mrs gabberly why no my dear i can't say i did but that makes no difference you know everybody is aware that it is a noble situation for him and that's the main point of course oh certainly i only asked from idle curiosity and i suppose mrs gabberly that it is because i am so idle that i do often feel curious about things that nobody else seems to care about do you know i am dying to get into a factory and see all these dear little children at work it must be so pretty to see them all looking so proud and so happy and all enjoying themselves so much i really must get a peep at it said miss brotherton la my dear what a very queer notion replied mrs gabberly perhaps it is said mary smiling as nobody else in the whole neighbourhood ever talks about it but if i have such a fancy there can be no reason why i should not indulge it can there why good gracious my dear child only think of the dirt you would be downright poisoned mary poisoned how can that be dear mrs gabberly when everybody agrees that it is such a blessing to the country to have brought such multitudes of children to work together in these factories nonsense my dear replied mrs gabberly knitting her brows this is some of mrs tremlett's vulgar ignorance i am very sure how can a girl of your good understanding miss brotherton speak as if what was good and proper for the working classes had anything to do with such as you fie my dear pray never let anybody in the neighbourhood hear you talk in this strange wild way i do assure you that there is nothing that would do you so much injury in the opinion of all the first families hereabouts and nobody knows this neighbourhood better than i do i am quite aware of that mrs gabberly said the young lady very respectfully and that is one reason why i wish to talk to you about this notion of mine is it really true mrs gabberly that none of the ladies in the neighbourhood ever go into the factories to be sure it is why should they go for goodness sake oh i don't know exactly but i cannot see why they should not if they wish it replied miss brotherton modestly well now but i do my dear and i do beg and entreat that you won't talk any more about it i am quite sure mary that somebody or other has been talking nonsense to you about all this if you have got any friends or connections to words fairly now i should think they had been telling you all the romantic stuff that has been hatching there about factory children and god knows what beside but i don't believe you have ever gone visiting that way have you my dear and who is there at fairly dear mrs gabberly who would be likely to talk to me on such a subject said mary colouring to the temples with eagerness to hear the answer good gracious my dear did you never hear tell of that poor wrong-headed clergyman george bell such a difference to be sure between one man and another 
my dear good mr gabberly never in his life breathed a word that could hurt the feelings of his neighbours he visited them every one and was on the best and most friendly terms with them all which is what i call living in the true spirit of christian charity whereas this tiresome troublesome mr bell has taken it into his head to find out wrong where everybody else sees nothing but right and god forbid my dear that you should take it into your dear innocent head to follow any of his mischievous fancies i wonder what he'll get by it great goose he must be to be sure not to see that he is going exactly the way to set everybody that can be of the least use to him smack against him in all things what is it he does mrs gabberly that is so very wrong demanded miss brotherton what is it he does why just everything he ought not to do my dear that's all you would hardly believe perhaps that a clergyman should actually encourage the poor to complain of the very labour by which they live and yet i give you my word and honour that is exactly what he has been doing it's incredible isn't it almost he positively says loud enough for all the country to hear him that the labour in the factories such a blessing as it is to the poor he actually says that it is bad for the children's health such stuff you know my dear as if the medical men did not know best and there's numbers of em that declare that it's quite impossible to tell in any way satisfactory that it can't do em any harm at all and upon my word i don't know what poor people will come to it's quite out of the question to attempt pleasing em if they've got no work they are perfectly outrageous about that and ready to tear people to pieces just to get it and no sooner is there enough to do than away they go bawling again swearing that the children are overworked isn't it provoking my dear mr george bell said mary very distinctly yes my dear that's the name of the foolish man who seems to take a pleasure in making people fancy they are not well enough off when i'm sure by all i can hear and understand these very identical people may consider themselves first and foremost of the whole world for prosperity replied mrs gabberly fairly rejoined miss brotherton interrogatively yes my dear fairly's where he lives if i don't mistake good morning mrs gabberly said the young lady rising somewhat abruptly i am very glad you had such a pleasant day yesterday good-bye and without permitting the stream of mrs gabberly's eloquence to well forth upon her afresh the heiress slipped through the parlour door and escaped End of chapter eighteen Chapter Nineteen of the Life and Adventures of Michael Armstrong, the Factory Boy. This is a LibriVox recording. Chapter Nineteen, A Voyage of Discovery, a plain statement leading to the conviction that even where ignorance is not bliss, knowledge is not always happiness. A hasty friendship that may, nevertheless, prove lasting. To order the carriage and to give Mrs. Tremlett notice that she wished her to make all speed in preparing to accompany her in it was to Miss Brotherton the work of a moment. As the business she was upon might, however, take some hours, she urged her old friend to eat luncheon as if certain of having no dinner, and having given time for this and interrogated her coachman concerning distance and so forth, the hopeful animated girl sprung into her carriage as the clock struck two determined not to re-enter her mansion till she had lost some portion of the ignorance which had of late so cruelly tormented her the roads were good and by the help of a short bait miss brotherton and her companion reached fairly turnpike a little after four here she made inquiries for the residence of mr bell and having learned in what direction she should find it repeated the instructions to her coachman and bade him drive on are the horses to be put up there ma'am demanded the coachman Yes no james not there i suppose that is not at the clergyman's house but of course you will be able to find some place quite near you know and william must wait no not to wait but come back as soon as he knows where you put up that i may send for you when i am ready to these not over clear instructions james answered yes ma'am and drove off in obedience to the directions received at the toll-bar the carriage soon left the high road and proceeded down a grassy lane which harvest carts for the time had rolled into smoothness 
less than a quarter of a mile of this brought the wanderers to another turning that in five minutes placed them before the gates of an edifice the aspect of which made mary pull the check-string that looks like a parsonage house does it not said miss brotherton and before mrs tremlett could answer william had already opened the door and let down the steps it was very easy to get out and very easy to inquire if mr bell were at home but when answered in the affirmative miss brotherton felt that it was not very easy to decide in what manner to explain the cause of her visit to the object of it she had by no means settled this point to her satisfaction when the door of a small parlour lined with books was opened to her and she found herself in the presence of the gentleman she had so unceremoniously come to visit there was much in the countenance of mr bell to reassure a more timid spirit than that of mary brotherton nevertheless she stood before him for a minute or two in some embarrassment not so much from fear of himself as of herself did she fail to make him at once understand the motive of her inquiries he could not avoid thinking both them and herself impertinent and this consciousness caused a much brighter glow than usual to mantle her cheeks as she stood before him with her eyes fixed timidly and almost beseechingly on his face although miss brotherton had not quite the easy and tant soit peu assured air of a woman of fashion there was enough in her appearance to indicate her claim to observance as well as admiration and mr bell opened the conversation by earnestly requesting that she would sit down his aspect had done much towards giving her courage and his voice did more you are very kind sir said she to receive so courteously a stranger who has in truth no excuse whatever to offer for thus intruding on you nevertheless i am greatly tempted to hope that if i can succeed in making you understand the object of my visit you will forgive the freedom of it and i returned mr bell smiling am greatly tempted to believe that let the object of this visit be what it may i must always feel grateful to it is there anything my dear young lady that i can do to serve you there is indeed mr bell she replied with great earnestness of voice and manner i am come to you for instruction though you do not know me you probably may know the place at which i live my name is mary brotherton and my house is called milford park certainly miss brotherton both your name and that of your residence are known to me on what subject can i give you any information that may be useful circumstances mr bell have lately directed my attention to a subject which my own situation in life as well as the neighbourhood in which i live ought to have long ago made thoroughly familiar to me such is not the case however i am profoundly and i fear shamefully ignorant respecting the large and very important class of our population employed in the factories i am in possession of a large fortune wholly amassed from the profits obtained by my father from this species of labour and i cannot but feel great interest in the welfare and prosperity of the people employed in it especially as i understand a very large proportion of them are young children and moreover that from some cause or other which i can by no means understand the whole class of the factory people as i hear them called are spoken of with less kindness and respect by those who have grown rich upon their industry than any other description of human beings whatever i am told sir that it would be unsafe improper and altogether wrong were i to attempt making myself personally acquainted with them as i would wish to do and having accidentally mr bell heard your name mentioned as a person who took an interest in their concerns i have come to you thus unceremoniously in the hope that you would have the kindness to give me more accurate information on the subject than i have found it possible to obtain elsewhere mr bell who had placed himself immediately opposite to her looked in her young face and listened to her earnest voice as she spoke with the deepest attention it soon became sufficiently clear that he considered not this intrusion as requiring apology but that on the contrary his very heart and soul were moved by her words he paused for a moment after she had ceased speaking as if unwilling to interrupt her by his reply but when he found that she remained silent he said the subject on which you are come to converse with me my dear miss brotherton is assuredly the very last i should have expected to hear named by a young lady in your position for it is one from which the rich and great of our district turn away with loathing and contempt yet is it the one of all others to which i would if possible direct their best attention involving as it does both their interest and their duty beyond any other but i fear i cannot enter upon it without wounding many prejudices which of necessity you must have imbibed and proving to you that much which doubtless you have been educated to consider right 
is on the contrary most lamentably wrong can you bear this my dear young lady i hope i could in a search after truth mr bell even if my mind were in the condition you suppose replied mary but this is not the case you will not have to remove many false impressions i think it is the total absence of all knowledge on the subject which i am bold enough to ask you to remedy and most willingly will i endeavour to do so to the very best of my ability replied mr bell but to me it is a beguiling subject and if i detain you too long you must tell me so fear not replied mary smiling i shall be more willing to hear than you to speak you are of course aware miss brotherton resumed the clergyman that the large proportion of young labourers to whom you have just alluded are calculated to amount in yorkshire and lancashire alone to upwards of two hundred thousand is it possible exclaimed mary alas mr bell you must not think that of course i know anything had you named two thousand as the number my surprise would have been less but so it is miss brotherton above two hundred thousand young creatures including infants among them counting only five years of life are thus employed in the counties i have named and they surely form a class which both from their numbers and their helplessness are entitled to english sympathy and protection unquestionably cried mary eagerly i always feel that the labouring poor have great and unceasing claims upon the sympathy and assistance of the rich but this claim must be equally great i should suppose amongst all the labouring classes is it not mr bell i feel it difficult to answer your question by a negative he replied because taken in its broadest sense it most assuredly demands an affirmative nevertheless it is unquestionably true that at this moment there is no race of human beings in any portion of the known world the most wretched of negro slaves not excepted miss brotherton who require the protection and assistance of their happier fellow-creatures in the same degree as the young creatures employed in our factories miss brotherton looked at him not doubtingly but with considerable surprise and timidly replied but the negro slave mr bell has no choice left him he is the property of his master neither has the factory child a choice miss brotherton he too is a property nor is it the least horrible part of the evil which noiselessly has grown out of this tremendous system that the beings whom nature has ordained throughout creation to keep watch and ward over the helpless weakness of an infant life are driven by it to struggle with and trample down the holiest and dearest of human ties even the love of a parent for its offspring picture to yourself a bleak winter's morning miss brotherton when the mother of factory children must be up hours and hours before the sun to rouse her half-rested little ones and nervously watching her rude clock till the dreaded moment comes must shake the little creatures whose slumber the very beast of the field might teach her to watch over and guard till they awake and starting in terror from their short sleep ask if the hour be come the wretched mother and the wretched child then vie with each other in their trembling haste to seize the tattered milk clothes and to put them on the mother dreads the fine of one quarter of the infant's daily wages which would be levied should it arrive but a minute too late and the poor child dreads the strap which in addition is as surely the punishment for delay miss brotherton i have seen with my own eyes the assembling of some hundreds of factory children before the still unopened doors of their prison-house while the lingering darkness of a winter's night had yet to last three hours i shall never forget one bitter morning last january twelvemonth the last piteous summons from a dying parishioner had left me no choice but to exchange my pillow for the bitter biting blast of howley common and the path across it leading me within a hundred yards of a large cotton factory i witnessed a spectacle which to my dying day i shall never recall without a shudder there was just moon enough to show me all the dreary sternness of the scene the ground was covered with deep snow and a cutting wind blew whistling through the long line of old scotch firs which bordered an enclosure beside the road as i scudded on beneath them my eye caught the little figures of a multitude of children made distinctly visible even by that dim light by the strong relief in which their dark garments showed against the snow a few steps further brought me in full view of the factory gates and then i perceived considerably above two hundred of these miserable little victims to avarice all huddled together on the ground and seemingly half buried in the drift that was blown against them i stood still and gazed upon them 
i knew full well what and how great was the terror which had brought them there too soon and in my heart of hearts i cursed the boasted manufacturing wealth of england which running in this direction at least in a most darkened narrow channel gives power lawless and irresistible to overwhelm and crush the land it pretends to fructify while still spellbound by this appalling picture i was startled by the sound of a low moaning from the other side of the road at a short distance from me and turning towards it perceived a woman bending over a little girl who appeared sinking to the ground a few rapid steps brought me close to them and i found on examination that the child was so benumbed and exhausted as to be totally incapable of pursuing her way it was her mother who was urging her forward and who even then seemed more intent upon saving a fine than on the obvious sufferings of her sinking child i know poor wretch that little choice was left her and that the inevitable consequence of saving her from the factory and leading her gently home to such shelter as her father's roof could give would be to watch her perish there for want of food alas alas is it thus my wealth has been accumulated exclaimed miss brotherton shuddering is there no power in england sir righteous and strong enough to stay this plague miss brotherton returned the clergyman such power and such righteousness must be found or this plague as you well call it will poison the very life-blood of our political existence and long ere any serious danger is likely to be dreamed of by our heedless rulers the bloated wealth with which this pernicious system has enriched a few will prove a source of utter destruction to the many never my dear young lady did the avarice of man conceive a system so horribly destructive of every touch of human feeling as that by which the low-priced agony of labourine infants is made to eke out and supply all that is wanting to enable the giant engines of our factories to outspin all the world but you must see it miss brotherton you must watch it with your own eyes you must follow the hateful operations of this atrocious system into the thousands of sordid and forgotten huts which cover its miserable victims ere you can possibly understand its moral mischief there is no strength no power in words to paint it it's moral mischief said mary eagerly explain that to me mr bell for it is the point i find most puzzling why is it that these poor factory people because they labour more unremittingly as it should seem than all the world beside why for this reason instead of being honoured for their industry are they invariably spoken of with contempt and obloquy your question miss brotherton involves by far the most terrible portion of this frightful commercial mystery he replied but as i have told you nothing except personal investigation can enable the inquirer to arrive at the whole truth respecting it were a patient accurate and laborious detail of all the enormities committed and all the sufferings endured under the factory system to be presented to the public it would be thrown aside by some as greatly too tedious for examination and by others as a statement too atrocious to merit belief yet england must listen to it and that soon or she may mourn her negligence when it is too late to repair it that marvellous machinery of which we make our boast miss brotherton is not more perfect in its power of drawing out the delicately attenuated thread with which it is our glory to produce than the system for reducing the human labour necessary for its production to the lowest possible price is for degrading the moral nature of the helpless slaves engaged in it that the system has such a tendency i cannot doubt after the repeated assurances which have reached me that so it is replied mary nevertheless i am still unable to comprehend why it should be so you have only to take advantage of your residence near ashleigh miss brotherton the dense population of which subsists almost wholly by factory labour in order to understand but too well why this terrible result is inevitable you are as yet too young a lady for me to expect that you should have very deeply studied the nature of the human mind or made yourself fully aware how greatly the habits and character of all human beings depend upon education and the circumstances in which they are placed nevertheless if you turn your attention to the subject you will not young as you are be long incapable of detecting the dangers which beset the hearts and souls of those whose unhappy destiny have made them factory labourers the dark little circle in which they move from birth to death from father to son from mother to daughter is so uniform that almost any average individual case may fairly serve as a specimen of the whole class boys and girls with few exceptions 
labor indiscriminately all together in the factories while still almost children they form connections and are married having worked in the mills probably from five years old to the hour of their unweighed and thoughtless union the boy assumes the duties of a husband with little more knowledge of moral or religious responsibility than the brute animal that labors with a thousand times less degradation in the fields while the childish wife comes to her important task ignorant of every earthly usefulness save what belongs to the mechanical drudgery in which throughout the whole of her short sad life she has been made to follow the uniform and ceaseless movements of machinery she cannot sew she cannot cook she cannot iron she cannot wash her mind is yet more untaught and undisciplined than her hands she is conscious of no responsibility she knows no law by which to steer her actions or regulate her spirit and becomes a mother as she became a wife without one single thought of duty mixing itself with her increasing cares by degrees both the husband and the wife find employment in the factory less certain it is for children 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 that the unwearied engine calls and keenly does the hungry father and the mother too watch the growth of the little creatures to whom they have given birth till the slight limbs have firmness enough to stand and the delicate joints are sufficiently under the command of the frightened will to tie threads together under the potent inspiration of the overlooker's strap then comes a state of deeper degradation still the father is idle for often he can get no work and it is to the labour of his little ones that he looks for bread nature recoils from the spectacle of their unnatural or laboured aspect as they return from their thirteen fourteen fifteen hours of toil he has not nerve to look upon it and creeps to the gin shops till they are hid in bed the mother sees it all and sternly screws her courage to the task of lifting their bruised and weary limbs upon their bed of straw putting in their mouths the food she has prepared their weary eyes being already closed in sleep and preparing herself to wake before the sun on the morrow that with unrelenting hand she may drag them from their unfinished slumber and drive them forth again to get her food this is no varnished tale miss brotherton but the bare naked hideous truth and can you wonder that beings thus reared and ripened should form a degraded class can you wonder that all others should turn from them as from a race with whom they have nothing in common if some sad accident preceding birth disturbs the beautiful process by which nature prepares the noble being she has made to be lord of all and an abortive creature comes to life curtailed of all its fair proportions both of mind and body all within reach of the hapless prodigy shudder as they mourn and the best and wisest among them pray to god that its span of life be short but believe me when i tell you miss brotherton that the effect which the factories of this district is producing upon above two hundred thousand of its population is beyond all calculation more deplorable and many a child is born amongst them whose destiny if fairly weighed against that of such as one as i have described would appear incomparably more terrible can such things be and the rulers of the land sit idly by to witness it cried mary shuddering it seems as if the rulers of the land knew little and cared less about it replied mr bell the profoundly ignorant opinion that there is some connection between our national prosperity and the enormous fortunes amassed by some score of north country manufacturers has i believe produced much of the lamentable non-interference of which the disinterested few complain who are near enough to look upon the frightful game some individual voices have been most gloriously raised on this tremendous theme and if they will be steadfast and enduring they must and will prevail for human nature with all its vices is not framed to look coldly on such horrors and permit them but the remedial process is so slow it is so difficult to arouse the attention and awaken the feelings of busy men concerning things at a distance whose connection with all that they deem important they are too ignorant of or too preoccupied to trace that the keenest observers and those who would the most deeply deprecate any remedy but a legal one begin to fear that mercy will be clamoured for with very dangerous rudeness before the parliament of england shall have roused up its wisdom to the task of affording it and in what way mr bell is it wished or hoped that the legislature should step forward to cure this dreadful evil is it proposed to abolish the use of machinery mr bell smiled and shook his head you perhaps think said he 
that there is a great disproportion between my strong sense of the vice and suffering produced by the factory system and the measure for its mitigation to which i now limit almost my wishes but it would be vain to look back to the time when steam-engines were not and there would indeed be little wisdom in addressing our lamentations to their introduction it is not the acquisition of any natural power principle or faculty that we should deplore all such on the contrary should be hailed as part and parcel of our magnificent birthright and each new use we learn to make of the still much unknown creation around us ought to be welcomed with a shout of praise as a fresh fulfilment of the supreme command replenish the earth and subdue it it is not from increased or increasing science that we have anything to dread it is only from a fearfully culpable neglect of the moral power that should rule and regulate its uses that it can be other than one of god's best gifts but how demanded mary how if machinery continues to be used can an act of parliament prevent the necessity of employing children to wait upon its operations instead of requiring the strength of men as heretofore to perform what the steam-engine does in their place no act of parliament can be conceived capable of inducing a manufacturer to employ the weaker and at the same time the more costly agent in preference to a more powerful and cheaper one replied mr bell no reasonable man would ask this no reasonable man would desire it and assuredly no reasonable man would attempt to enforce such an absurdity by law no miss brotherton this mighty power as surely given for our use as is the innocent air that fans the woodbine yonder has at length after some few thousand years of careless overlooking on our part been revealed to us but let us not fly in the face of benignant nature and say like caliban you taught me language and my prophet aunt is i know how to curse if used aright there cannot be a doubt that this magnificent power might in all its agencies be made the friend of man it requires no great stretch of ingenuity to conceive that it might be rendered at once a source of still increasing wealth to the capitalist and of lightened labour to the not impoverished operative but that as things are at present this great discovery and all the admirable ingenuity with which it is applied acts as a ban instead of a blessing upon some hundred thousands of miserable victims is most true while all the benefit that can be shown as a balance to this horror is the bloated wealth of a small knot of master manufacturers but so monstrous is this evil that its very atrocity inspires hope from the improbability that when once beyond all reach of contradiction its existence shall be known by all men it should be permitted to continue then why is it not known demanded mary her colour heightened as she remembered her own entire ignorance upon the subject a few short weeks before surely it is the duty of all lookers-on to proclaim it to the whole world alas miss brotherton it is more easy to raise a voice than to command attention to it loud and long must be the cry that shall awaken the indifferent and rouse the indolent to action but this loud long cry will be uttered and by the blessing of god it will be listened to at last but tell me mr bell resumed his deeply interested auditor what is this moderate enactment in mitigation of these wretched people's sufferings which you say would content you all that we ask for replied mr bell all that the poor creatures ask for themselves is that by act of parliament it should be rendered illegal for men women and children to be kept to the wearying unhealthy labour of the mills for more than ten hours out of every day leaving their daily wages at the same rate as now and would that suffice demanded miss brotherton with astonishment to effectually relieve the horrors you have been describing to me miss brotherton it would replied the clergyman i would be loath to weary you with details he continued but a few items may suffice to make you see how enormous are the benefits which would follow such an enactment at present if a large demand for manufactured goods arises instead of being as it ought a blessing to the industrious hands that must supply it it comes upon them as a fearful burden threatening to crush the very springs of life in the little creatures that are chiefly to sustain it while the golden harvest that brings it is not for them but for their masters for the miserable need of an extra penny or sometimes three halfpence a day the young slaves who observe have no power of choice for if they or their parents for them refuse they are instantly turned off to literal starvation no parish assistance being allowed to those who resist the regulations of the manufacturers 
for this wretched equivalent for health and joy are compelled whenever our boasted trade flows briskly to stand to their work for just as many hours as the application of the overlooker's strap or billy roller can keep them on their legs innumerable instances are on record of children falling from excess of weariness on the machinery and being called to life by its lacerating their flesh it continually happens that young creatures under fifteen years of age are kept from their beds all night fifteen sixteen seventeen hours of labour out of the twenty-four are cases which recur continually and i need not say with what effect upon these victims of ferocious avarice now not only would all this be mended the positive bodily torture spared and as far as is consistent with constant indoor occupation the health of the labourers preserved were it made unlawful to keep them at positive labour for more than ten hours of every day not only would all this follow from the enactment but innumerable other advantages some of them more important still would beyond all question be its consequence in the first place were there no power of executing great and sudden orders by irregular exactions of labour the recurrence of those fearful intervals when the starving operatives are thrown out of employ by the accidents which cause a deficiency in the demand would not happen for in that case the capitalists would find themselves obliged to be beforehand with the demand even though some portion of their enormous wealth should for a time lie idle from this would also follow the necessity of often employing adult hands where now the cheaper labour of children forced from their very vitals through the day and night may be had for the sin of demanding it then would the unnatural spectacle of a stalwart father idly waiting to snatch the wages from the little feverish hand of his o'er-laboured child be seen no more then would there be strength and spirits left in the young to profit by the sunday schools now so often ostentatiously opened in vain because the only way in which a little piecer can keep holiday is by lying throughout the day stretched upon his straw in heavy sleep then too the demoralizing process by which the heart of a mother is rendered hard as the nether millstone by the necessity of goading her infants to their frightful toil would cease boys and girls would no longer have to return to their homes at midnight there would be time and inclination then for those comfortable operations of the needle and the shears which make old clothes look amazed as weal as new then would not the disheartened ministers of god's church strive in vain to make the reckless joyless worthless race listen to his words of faith and hope then miss brotherton they would arise from that state of outcast degradation which has caused your friends to tell you that it would be unsafe improper and altogether wrong for you and such as you to make personal acquaintance with them and do you really think that all this mighty this glorious good would follow from an enactment so moderate so reasonable so every way unobjectionable i have not the slightest shadow of a doubt miss brotherton that such good would follow it and more much more than i have named more than any one could believe or comprehend who has not like myself been watching for years the misery the vice the degradation which have resulted from the want of it then why mr bell have not such representations been made to the legislature as must ensure its immediate adoption the good clergyman shook his head it is a most natural question my dear young friend allow me so to call you all are my friends who feel upon this subject as you appear to do it is a most natural and most obvious question yet would my reply be anything rather than easy of comprehension were i to attempt to answer it directly i sincerely hope i shall converse with you again on this subject documents are not wanting my dear miss brotherton to prove that all or nearly all that private individuals can do in the way of petition and remonstrance has been already tried nor are we yet without hope that good may come of it but it must be long and perhaps the longer the better ere your young head and innocent heart can conceive our difficulties you would hardly believe the ingenious devices to which frightened avarice can have recourse in order to retard mutilate and render abortive a measure having for its object a reduction of profits with no equivalent save the beholding smiles instead of tears and hearing the sounds of song and laughter instead of groans but while you are still waiting and hoping for this aid from our lawgivers said mary is there nothing that can be done in the interval to help all this misery mr bell nothing effectual my dear young lady he replied mournfully 
i may with no dishonest boasting say that my life is spent in doing all i can to save these unhappy people from utter degradation and despair but the oppression under which they groan is too overwhelming to be removed or even lightened by any agency less powerful than that of the law nothing in fact can so clearly show the powerful oppression of the system as the total inefficiency of individual benevolence to heal the misery of those who suffer under it its power is stupendous awful terrible nature herself elsewhere so omnipotent here feels the strength of unchecked human wickedness and seems to bend before it for most certain is it that in less than half a century during which the present factory system has been in operation the lineaments of the race involved in it are changed and deteriorated the manufacturing population are of lesser and of weaker growth than their agricultural countrymen the development of the intellectual faculties is obviously becoming weaker and many whom we have every reason to believe understand the physiology of man as thoroughly as science can teach it to them do not scruple to assert that if the present system continues the race of english factory operatives will dwindle and sink in the strongly graduated scale of human beings to something lower than the eskimo gracious heaven cried mary clasping her hands with an emotion that almost amounted to agony and all these horrors are perpetrated for the sake of making rich needlessly uselessly rich a few obscure manufacturing families like my own this is very dreadful sir she continued while tears burst from her eyes i have gained knowledge but not peace by my visit and i must leave you with the sad conviction that the hope i had nourished of making my fortune useful to the suffering creatures among whom i live is vain and idle mr bell listened to this melancholy assertion and sighed because he could not contradict it yes said he at length it is even so and if any proof were wanted of the depth and hopelessness of the wretchedness which the present system produces it might be found in the fact that despite the inclination i feel both for your sake and that of the poor operatives to encourage your generous benevolence i cannot in all conscience tell you that it is in your power effectually to assist them that you may save your own excellent heart from the palsy of hopeless and helpless pity by the indulgence of your benevolence in individual cases of distress i need not point out to you but that any of the ordinary modes of being useful on a larger scale such as organizing schools founding benefit societies or the like could be of any use to being so crushed so toil-worn and so degraded it would be idle to hope miss brotherton now rose to depart but as she extended her hand and began to utter her farewell it occurred to her that it was possible her new friend might by conjecture at least throw some light upon the destination of little michael and avoiding as much as possible the making any direct charge against her rich neighbour she briefly narrated the facts of michael's adoption dismissal and unknown destination with little commentary on either but concluded by saying the mother of the child is in great anxiety about him and though i cannot conceive it possible any harm can have befallen the boy i am in some sort a fellow-sufferer with her in the anxiety which this mystery occasions from having almost pledged myself to learn the place of his destination can you dear sir suggest to me any means by which this information can be obtained some part of this history has reached us already replied mr bell it has been somewhat industrially bruited through the neighbourhood that sir matthew dowling notoriously one of the most tyrannical millocrats in the whole district has been moved to kindness on behalf of some poor widow's son and taken him to be reared and educated with his own children i trust i am excusable knowing what i know for misdoubting the disinterested benevolence of any act of sir matthew dowling's nevertheless it is certainly not easy to perceive why after having so ostentatiously distinguished the boy he should kidnap him as it were from his own house in order to get rid of him if instead of being the object of a special favour the little fellow had fallen under the rich knight's displeasure miss brotherton i should think it by no means improbable that he might have consigned him as an apprentice to some establishment too notorious for its severity to make it desirable that his selection of it should be made known but of this there seems neither proof nor likelihood miss brotherton turned pale as she listened to this suggestion nay but there is both truth and likelihood in such a suspicion she exclaimed with considerable emotion and after a moment's consideration added i know no reason why i should conceal the cause i have for saying so if you know not all how can you give me counsel hurriedly and as briefly as possible 
miss brotherton then recounted the scene she had witnessed in the green room of the dowling lodge theatricals but there was an unconscious and involuntary fervour in her manner of narrating it which rendered it impossible to listen with indifference or not to feel at the recital some portion of the indignation she had felt when it occurred it must be looked to miss brotherton replied her warm-hearted new acquaintance the boy must be traced tracked found and rescued i think there are few of these wretched prison-houses of whose existence i am ignorant and it is probable i may be able to help you in this should i obtain any hint likely to be useful in the search i will call upon you if you will give me leave to communicate it most earnestly and truly did the heiress assure him that it was impossible she could receive a visit more calculated to give her pleasure adding that whether the hint were obtained or not she trusted the acquaintance she had so unceremoniously began would not drop here and that by returning her visit he would prove to her that he was not displeased by it it rarely happens between right-hearted people who meet for the first time if one of the parties conceives a liking for the other that it fails to prove mutual and it was with a cordial sincerity as genuine as her own that mr bell expressed his hope that their acquaintance would ripen into friendship too intently occupied by all that had passed to remember her own arrangements mary forgot that her carriage was not at the door and while these parting words were exchanged walked forth expecting to find it it was mrs tremlett who first recollected that the coachman had been ordered to put up his horses at the nearest inn but this was not till they had traversed the little garden and were already in the lane for though the good nurse had been little more than personnage muet during the foregoing scene she had taken a deep interest in it and it was much with the air of one awakening from a dream that she said my dear miss mary you have forgot that the carriage is sent away indeed i have said mary laughing and no wonder but there stands our faithful william he will tell us in what direction we may find it will you not return miss brotherton while it is made ready said the clergyman not if you will walk on with us dear sir the evening is delightful but already quite far enough advanced to make it prudent not to lose any time and having given orders that the carriage was to follow they strolled on towards the turnpike there said mr bell pointing to the towering chimneys of a large factory at some distance there miss brotherton is an establishment where though carding and spinning go on within the walls and some hundreds of children and young girls are employed in attending the machinery that performs the process the voice of misery is never heard for there the love of gold is chained and held captive by religion and humanity thank god exclaimed mary as she looked at the sinless monster to which he pointed it is not of necessity then that this dangerous trade is fatal to all employed in it certainly not were but its labours restricted both for young and old to ten hours a day there is no reason on earth why it should not be carried on with comfort and advantage to every individual concerned in it and with credit honour and prosperity to the country but you can hardly guess what uphill work it is when one good man has got to stand alone and breast the competition of a whole host of bad ones in his commercial enterprises the high-minded owners of yonder factory are losing thousands every year by their efforts to purify this traffic of its enormities and some thousand small still voices call down blessings on them for it but while it costs them ten shillings to produce what their neighbours can bring in to the market for nine they will only be pointed at as pitiably unwise in their generation by all the great family of mammon which surrounds them few alas will think of following the example all they can do therefore is in fact but to carry on a system of private charity on an enormous scale but till they are supported by law even their vast efforts and most noble sacrifices can do nothing towards the general redemption of our poor northern people from the state of slavery into which they have fallen and yet i do believe miss brotherton he continued after a pause i do most truly believe that these greedy tyrants would fail more rarely than now they do in their efforts to realize enormous wealth if the system were to undergo exactly the change we ask for the plan of underselling may indeed in some few instances enable a very lucky man to run up a blood-stained fortune and blood-stained it must be for whenever this method of commanding a sale is pursued and ruin does not ensue it is demonstrable that the bones and marrow of children working unlimited hours must have been the main agent in the operation but it is quite certain that the underselling system must upon the long run be ruinous 
if all the losses upon our production were fairly set against all the gains from the immoderate working of young hands the slavery scheme would appear as little profitable as holy ah but here is your carriage my dear young lady god bless you and may we live to rejoice together over an effectual legislative remedy for the evils we have passed this our first interview in deploring so saying he extended his hand to assist her into the carriage which had already drawn up beside them but miss brotherton stepped aside while he performed this office to her friend and then laying her hand on his arm drew him back a step or two to the spot from whence the factory chimneys he had pointed out to her were visible tell me before we part she said the names of those to whom that building belongs wood and walker replied the clergyman thank you she replied i shall never hear those names without breathing a blessing on them friendly farewells were once more exchanged and the meditative heiress was driven back to milford park in silence so profound that her old friend believed her to be asleep and carefully abstained from any movement that might awaken her but mary brotherton was not asleep End of chapter 19chapter twenty of the life and adventures of michael armstrong this is a librivox recording chapter twenty trade in a flourishing state the benefits conferred thereby to those employed in it the natural logic of religion its fallibility when put to the test the moment at which michael armstrong entered the cotton mill at deep valley was a critical one the summer had been more than commonly sultry and a large order had kept all hands very sharply at work even at dead of night the machinery was never stopped and when one set of fainting children were dragged from the mules another set were dragged from the reeking beds they were about to occupy in order to take their places the ventilation throughout the whole fabric was exceedingly imperfect the heat particularly in the rooms immediately beneath the roof frightfully intense cleanliness as to the beds the floors and the walls utterly neglected and even the persons of the children permitted to be filthy to excess from having no soap allowed to assist their ablutions though from the greasy nature of their employment it was peculiarly required while the coarse meal occasionally gave out to supply its place was invariably swallowed being far too precious in the eyes of the hungry children to be applied to the purpose for which it was designed in addition to all this the food was miserably scanty and of a nature so totally unfit to sustain the strength of growing children thus severely worked that within a fortnight after michael's arrival an epidemic fever of very alarming description began to shew itself but it had made considerable progress before the presence of this new horror was revealed to him notwithstanding all the hardships of brookford factory no infectious disease had ever appeared before which it is possible might have been owing to the fact that the majority of the labourers in it lived at a considerable distance thus ensuring to them a walk morning and night through the fresh air this though it added to their daily fatigue probably lessened the danger of it while the wretched hovels to which they returned for their short night's rest miserable shelters as they were reeked not with a congregated effluvia of fifty uncleansed sleepers in one chamber michael therefore had never before witnessed the hideous approach of contagion the general appearance too of the deep valley troop was so far from healthy that the sickly aspect of those first seized upon was less remarkable than it would have been elsewhere thus another week wore away during which though several of those who had been working when it began were withdrawn and known to be in the sick ward ere it closed the fact that an infectious fever was among them had not yet got wing poor dear betsy price whispered fanny fletcher to her friend michael as they sat side by side at their miserable dinner one day i heard missus tell master that she was dead but i am trying to be glad for it michael glad fanny replied the boy you told me once that you liked her more than any other girl in the mill and now you are glad she is dead i am not so glad as i think i ought to be returned fanny gently she will not be hungry in heaven michael nor will she work till she is ready to fall and surely god will give us green fields and sweet fresh air in heaven and there must be flowers michael oh i am quite sure of that and betsy price will have it all ought i not to be very very glad 
michael looked in her sweet innocent face as she said this and tears filled his eyes and if you die fanny must i be glad too if you thought about heaven as i do and if you loved me very much indeed replied the little girl i can't tell how you could help being glad but i do love you very much indeed said michael almost choked by his efforts not to cry and i do think of heaven too fanny but i couldn't be glad if you was to die not when you hear that michael said fanny starting up as the lash of the governor's whip resounded through the room as a signal that their numbered moments of rest were over i suppose then i love you better than you love me for i could not help being glad if i knew that you would never hear nor feel that lash again when they met again at supper michael though still unsuspicious of the cause missed three more children from their places he fancied too that there was something new and strange in the aspect of their hard-featured female tyrant she was paler than usual scolded not at all and when she spoke to her husband it was in a voice that hardly exceeded a whisper yet notwithstanding this some young ears again caught words that told of death yet still the mill worked on and nothing seemed to mark that any calamity more than usual had got among them by degrees however the growing pestilence burst forth as it were before the eyes of the terrified children and they knew that the grave yawned before them all then it was that the ghastly countenances of each doomed victim struck dismay into the hearts of their companions even before they were permitted to leave their labour and sink down to the rest that should be disturbed no more but still the mill went on for mr elgood sharpton had just received a glorious order from russia and it would have been perfect madness as this gentleman was heard to remark to his eldest son if a death or two among the apprentice's children was to check the mill at such a time as that so the mill went on and death went on too but as it is considered by all parties concerned to be extremely important that the cry of epidemic contagion should not be raised in the neighbourhood of a factory under these circumstances it was deemed best by mr elgood sharpton and his confidential managers not to call in medical assistance for first and foremost poulet said the experienced proprietor to the governor of the apprentice house first and foremost it is of no manner of use i never knew any proper regular contagious fever in my life that could be stopped short by a doctor you must take care of yourself and your wife of course and i will see that you have a hamper of good old port sent in and mind that both of you take two glasses a day each pullet one before you go into the rooms in the morning and the other after you have seen them all down for the night and we must order in a cask of vinegar to sprinkle the chambers trust me that this will do more good than all the doctors that ever were hatched besides the vinegar cask will never sing out you know poulet and the doctor might to this reasoning and to these arrangements no objection whatever was made by the governor of the apprentice house of athletic frame and iron nerves he grinned defiance at any danger that threatened his own person rightly enough thinking perhaps that any disease to which his water porridge fed troop appeared peculiarly liable would be little likely to attack himself it was however not the least part of his wisdom upon this occasion that he systematically paid as little attention to what was going on round him as possible had he made it a habit to look into the haggard faces of the drooping children as one after another they pined languished and sunk first into the horrible abyss of wretchedness called the sick ward and then into the grave it is possible that he too might in some degree have been shaken as it was however he went on so cleverly supplying the missing hands by recommending to the manager that one healthy child should do the work of two and so cleverly also getting all that died by day buried by night without making as he said any fuss or fidget about it whatever that mr elgood sharpton felt him to be eminently deserving of an especial reward and when fifteen children had been noiselessly buried in tugswell churchyard he presented him with a bank of england note for ten pounds as a testimony of his esteem and gratitude for his very exemplary and praiseworthy behaviour it fared not quite so well however with his wife whether it were that the poco curante system was less within reach of her position than of his or that her frame was less stoutly proof against the malaria with which she was surrounded a visible change came over her about three weeks after this visitation had been first felt at deep valley mills strong in constitution and athletic in form it seemed however no easy matter for disease itself to conquer her 
the large dark eye grew dim and sunk back behind her high cheekbones by degrees her coarse firm-set features appeared to relax and her active limbs to languish for two whole days before she yielded herself to the invincible power that had seized upon her it happened during this interval that fanny fletcher and michael in their eagerness to communicate to each other their observations on the rapidly increasing sickness of their fellow labourers hung back together as the frightened train swept on before the lifted lash of the governor and permitted nearly all their companions to reach the mill ere they had left the supper-room they were perhaps themselves unconscious how much they were emboldened to this hardy defiance of a standing law by the unwonted stillness of tongue and tameness of aspect observable in mrs poulet but if they fancied they were to escape entirely they were mistaken for whilst the little girl was telling michael that they ought always at work or not at work to be thinking of god who was perhaps thinking of them and meaning to take them both up together to his own happy heaven just as she had laid her hand on his to enforce her words and looking wistfully in his face pronounced aloud do michael do the sick dragon stepped back on hearing them from the passage that led into the kitchen and turning her ghastly face full upon them exclaimed while her languid fist strove in vain to clench and raise itself as in days of yore to threaten castigation do you devil imps i'll do ye off to your mules or by but ere she could finish the sentence her fever-laden sinews relaxed and seizing upon the long table for support she sank almost insensible upon a bench greatly terrified both michael and fanny screamed together but they screamed in vain there was no longer any one within hearing save in the closely packed chamber above where more than twenty sick children lay two and two together in their miserable beds but totally without nurses or attendants of any kind so that their loud cries though heard by many brought assistance from none oh michael michael she'll die too said fanny shuddering i would make her live longer if i could she is not fit to die go to the pump michael and fetch water go go dear boy we must not leave her this way the little girl endeavoured to raise the woman's head which had sunk upon the table but the effort was beyond her strength and feeling after a moment's reflection that the best manner of assisting her would be to call others she cried no no don't go michael don't go for the water it is no use my trying to hold her up and besides we don't know if it is good for her or not oh dear how dreadful bad she looks let us run away to the mill michael and tell the master the seizure of mrs poulet unlike every other became within an hour from the time it was known the theme of every tongue throughout the whole establishment had it been mr elgood sharpton himself it could not well have occasioned a greater sensation the effect this produced throughout the sickly troop might have served as a proof of the wisdom of a government when it conceals the mischief it has brought upon an empire for those who are likely to discuss it the total silence which till now had been preserved among the managers and overlookers respecting the contagious nature of the malady which had got among the children the absence of all medical attendance and of all precautionary or medical measures in any way calculated to excite attention had hitherto very successfully prevented rumour from doing her usual work on such occasions and it is probable that this partial ignorance of their own danger considerably lessened its consequences for it was only one or two such thoughtful meditative little things as fanny fletcher who had began to remember having heard of infectious fevers and to think that maybe it was something of that sort that had made numbers nine sixteen eighteen nineteen etc etc stay away so long and that too when the mill was so very busy but when it became generally known that the awful strength of mrs poulet was laid low and when the words the fever have couched her had once been pronounced aloud the palpable image of the pale tyrant seemed to stand frowning in the midst of them substituting his grisly hour-glass and scythe for the fist and the frown he had conquered the scene which followed this was very frightful those upon whom infection had seized sunk from their work at once despite the goading thong which had hitherto kept them from dropping as the spur and the lash sustained the failing post-horse while those who were yet untouched looked in each other's faces as if to watch who next should fail when the children from all the different floors of the fabric met together at their midday meal 
the first thought of each seemed to be the finding out who was missing since they last assembled and the shoulder that followed the perceiving another and another and another gone ran along the shortening lines with an agony which grew more and more intense as their numbers lessened when things had reached this state mr elgood sharpton agreed with mr Pullet that it might perhaps be as well to let an apothecary from tugswell visit the factory to which reluctant decision two reasons strongly contributed the first was that though with his usual forethought he had divided his nocturnal buryings between the churchyards of tugswell and meddington the clergyman of both had declared that their frequency rendered it necessary that some inquiry should be made into the cause of so great a mortality and the second was that the fact of the mistress of the apprentice house being herself at the point of death from the same malady must infallibly prove to the medical visitant that it was no treatment peculiar to the children which had occasioned it but that it had come beyond all possibility of contradiction by the visitation of god nevertheless the medical gentleman ventured to declare that nothing would be so likely to stop the contagion as nourishing food upon which the terrified manufacturer astonished all the butchers within his reach by commanding a large supply of beef and mutton good enough to make wholesome soup and before another ghastly week had passed away the wisdom of this prescription became so evident that when settling accounts together at the end of it mr pullet hinted to his employer that he did not feel quite sure whether upon the whole a little better living for the apprentices might not pay for all answer mr elgood sharpton put his finger to the sum total for provisions during the last two week and then turning back a page or two of the huge volume did the same by the sum total of a former week true sir true enough said mr pullet but howsomever it can't be denied that if we go on this fashion we shall have no hands left to work with and there would be but small profit in that sir my dear pullet you do not study the population returns as attentively as i do replied his enlightened master just at this moment it may be very right to cram them for several reasons the best being observe that by so doing we stop more mouths than their own but as to going on in the same style of expense when this fit of dying and gossiping is over it is quite out of the question and i do beg that you will never mention the subject to me again you can know little my good pullet of the rate at which pauper children are multiplied if you think it necessary to preserve them at this ruinous rate of expense if there were all of them to die off before the end of the month i would undertake to have their place supplied before the end of the next you may take my word for it that no man ever succeeded in business who did not know how to make out an accurate balance between profit and loss i know to a fraction what each of these prentice brats are worth pullet and i can tell you that such weekly bills as these would speedily turn the tables against us in that case sir there is surely no more to be said replied pullet and then changing the subject he added in course sir you won't object to my missus being buried by day instead of by night besides respect to her sir i think it would be quite as well shewing all the country you see as how flesh is but grass for the high as for the low and make it manifest to all the country that it can't be no want of good nursing and comfort as causes the deaths at our mill quite right quite right pullet replied the rapid-minded mr sharpton promptly i should not object even to stopping the mills for a couple of hours or so and making all the hands follow as mourners if you thought it would answer why as to that sir said the faithful servant i would not undertake to say that we should be able to get up much of a procession if we turned out the whole lot to choose from they couldn't stand i should think sir without the mules to hold by for so long together they totter frightful i can tell you when they starts first to move to and fro from factory to prentice house and back again and i don't think there would be either credit or profit in making a show of them well well do as you will pull it i don't care a brass farthing whether they walk or stand but i can't say when i built this factory it was with any view to make a show as you call it of the young ladies and gentlemen to be employed in it with a light laugh which challenged an answering laugh from the governor widower as he was mr elgood sharpton rose to depart pullet attended him to the outer gate and held his stirrup while he mounted reiterating his promises to do the best he could and only stipulating for plenty of vinegar and leave to use soap till the cold weather came in 
meanwhile though a less proportion died of those who were seized with the malady than before the improvement in the diet was introduced the plague was as yet very far from being stayed no day passed without many fresh victims sinking under its influence and it was no uncommon thing to see two or three wheelbarrows at a time towards the evening of every day conveying children from the factory to the apprentice house who had fallen while following the machinery for a whole week after the death of mrs pullet michael and his friend fanny both continued as it seemed unscathed and many were the grave discussions between them as to whether they ought to be sorry or glad that they were so fanny very steadily adhering to her first opinion that if they had a great deal of love for each other they would not let themselves be sorry if one saw the other go away and michael as steadily persisting that right or wrong he must be so very sorry if fanny went as not to care at all how soon he followed after the disinterested reasonings of the little girl were soon put to the proof michael looked so very ill one morning at breakfast that even the iron-hearted pullet told him that he had best mount to the sick ward before it was needful to carry him but michael looked at poor fanny and saw such an expression of terror and misery in her countenance that he could not help thinking she would change her mind about being glad if he did not go into work along with her so he told the governor that he wasn't bad at all and had rather work than not an assurance which it could not under any circumstances be mr pullet's duty to combat and accordingly michael got to his place in the mill and spoke cheeringly to fanny as he went along but before the hour of dinner he was on the floor and when the overlooker called to a stretcher to have him wheelbarrowed back to the prentice house fanny fletcher thought that she certainly did not love poor michael armstrong so much as she fancied she did for that if the choice had been given her she would a great deal rather have been taken ill herself in spite of a strap that she saw coming towards her and flourishing ready for duty in the air she helped to drag the unresisting body of her poor companion from before the mules and thoughtless and reckless of the consequences sat down and held his head on her knee till he was raised in the arms of the stretcher and carried off it was then and not till then that her tears began to flow and they flowed so fast that she could no longer see the uplifted strap nor was it till the blow had descended sharply on her arm that she was sufficiently mistress of her thoughts to remember that there was at any rate a hope that it might be her turn next and with this to comfort her she yielded meekly to the arm that pushed her to her usual place and resumed her occupation with more steadfast courage than at that moment any other hope could have given her but even this sad hope proved vain fanny fletcher still continued one of the very few upon whom the contagion had no effect for the first day or two after the removal of her friend her mind was almost wholly occupied by the expectation of feeling the same symptoms that she had witnessed in him and when these came not her thoughts reverted to the possibility of his recovering and coming again to work near her it was an established custom among those who alone could give information on the subject never to permit any questionings concerning the sick or if they were boldly hazarded to give no other reply than a rebuke so that day after day and week after week elapsed without her being at all able to guess whether michael were dead or alive by degrees however all hope of seeing him return faded from her mind and then poor little girl she found out that people can't always wish truly and really for what they know to be best either for themselves or others and day by day though still the fever touched her not she grew more pale more thin more melancholy now and then indeed it still occurred to her as possible that michael might reappear again as many had done after many days of sickness but alas none had ever stayed away so long as he had done she had questioned many who had been ill concerning him but none seemed to know or care anything about those who had shared the sick chamber with them till at length a boy to whom she had often addressed these questions because she happened to know that he had been taken to the sick ward on the same day as michael replied as if by a sudden effort of recollection oh that chap him what was one of the last has come ay ay i mind all about him he was dead and buried before he had been down three days fanny fletcher asked no more questions 
nor had she any longer hope of following where so many of her happier companions were gone the fever was pronounced to be over the factory and apprentice houses were whitewashed and a number of new inmates arrived all things in short at the deep valley mills appeared to be going on as prosperously as usual a statement which could be hardly impeached by the fact that one little girl there was growing paler and more shadow-like every day End of chapter 20